Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Well, let's see if I can get this. Here we go. All right. Last week, we ended up breaking into the last chapter of Paul's epistle to the Galatians. It is chapter 6. And out of 18 verses, we took down one verse. And so today, we're going to be a little more ambitious, at least a little bit more. We're going to cover a little more ground. Uh, I'm hoping, if, if I track well here, we are going to get uh, at least to verse 6. But the good news is next week, I am looking to close this series out. And I'll just preemptively tell you that it's going to be a lot heavier next week than it is uh, today. And so that's my hope, is that we, get, uh, we finish out the series. And so I'll be excited about that. All right, so we're going to draw back to verse 1. This is where we left off. Brethren, if a man is fast, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then we come to this uh, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and what? So fulfill the Torah of Mashiach. Now, we kind of jumped ahead when we were covering chapter 5. We jumped ahead here for a moment in chapter 6, in verse 2, because what we found is the Apostle Paul does something very, very interesting, especially in this day and age where we live today and the way Christianity has viewed the Torah. And what Paul does is he actually likens the Torah to the Torah of Mashiach. They're synonymous. Let me put this up here. So in Galatians 5.14, we're just going to run through this quickly. All the Torah is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself comes directly out of the heart of Torah. Leviticus 19, 18. And we know that the Torah promotes, it's a book of love. It promotes love. It's fascinating as we come to Galatians 6, 2. He says, bear one another's burdens. That is loving my neighbor as myself. But instead of just saying, calling it the Torah, fulfill the Torah, as he does here, he says, fulfill the Torah of Mashiach. Because the Torah is the Torah of Mashiach. It's the Torah of Messiah. And it would behoove us to start uh, introducing Paul's terminology. Taking a page out of his book, shall we say? So the next time you go to hold a Torah study, what you should be calling it, is yeah, we're going we're gonna to have a Torah of Christ study. And we need to start utilizing this terminology because it's going to put them in a mindset that they're going to, what now? What do you mean the Torah of Christ? You're studying the book of Deuteronomy. They need to understand what Paul understood. The Torah is Christ. He is the Torah made flesh. Literally. When I look to the Torah, what I see is Christ's character. His likes, his dislikes, his personality. His righteousness, his truth, it is all him. So it's a very different perspective than what the devil has given to the church today. He's given them a pseudo perspective. He's defaced the truth of what Torah is. It's Yeshua. And that's a very different perspective because when, when I go to the Torah, I am going to Yeshua. And I am looking for him. All aspects. That's why he says, you search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. He takes ownership of the Torah. It is him. It is his commandments. Read John 14, 15. Right? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That is a direct quote out of Exodus 20. Yeshua takes possession of the Torah. Awesome. And we've already covered that. So we're going to move on. Verse 3. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Such a little statement with a world of implication. Paul is delivering to the Galatians a very severe warning. And what is he warning against? Pride. Pride. And I'm going to tell you, you study the Bible you can start combing through the scriptures, and what you will find is that this sin, this particular sin, it's woven throughout the tapestry of the word. Look at the wisest man that ever lived, second to Yeshua, King Solomon, for whom people across the globe had come just to hear his wisdom. I challenge you, go read his book of Proverbs. 
What consumed him? Proverb after proverb after proverb, the wisest man on the earth is talking about pride. That is an amazing, that is an astounding thing. And the reason is, is he marveled at how sneaky and how clever this one little sin was. Very sneaky. And I'm going to tell you, this is a sin that has taken out many of righteous men. So seductively. And this is a sin that every single person in this room is confronted with. On many different levels, on many different degrees. And I'm going to tell you this. Pride, it wears thousands of different masks. Masks that you don't even realize when you're dealing with the issues. When you're manifesting in the flesh, you do not recognize the source, the root, is you've allowed pride into your heart. And this is a reality. This is a sin that I can tell you I have seen destroy friendships. It has destroyed uh, marriages, families. I've seen it destroy communities. Unbelievable path of destruction that this one little sin leaves. So today we are going to spend a little bit of time on this issue. And we're really going to draw out the severity here of Paul's concern because you, again, you need to feel the weight of it. Paul is amazing. He makes these little statements with, with world, uh, the profound implications. Just these little statements. We want to give this some teeth as so you can feel it. And what I, what I want to do is I want to take you to 2 Chronicles 26. And we're going to read about a story of a king of Judah. A king by the name of Uzziah. Okay? Or Uzziahu in, in, in the Hebrew. And this is what we read. Uzziahu was 16 years old when he became Melech, and he reigned 52 years in Yerushalayim. His mother's name was Jechaliah, or Yechaliah in Hebrew, of Yerushalayim. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that his father Amaziah had done, verse 5, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. The first thing I want you to recognize is Uzziahu, he was a man of God. He walked with God. God walked with him. God prospered him. He was the king of Jerusalem, the king of, of Yehuda. This is critical to see this. And we're going to jump ahead to verse 14. Then Uzziahu prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, slings to cast stones. And he made devices in Yerushalayim invented by skillful men to be on the towers in the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. Then we read this. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Where did he get the strength? It was by the living God. Where did he get that strength? And now we start to see his fame. It can't begin. When the Lord is with you in such a mighty way, the world's going to know it. And they did. His fame spreading far and wide. So this is what we read in verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. When he had all that, I mean, God with him, it is the strength of God who gave him power who gave him fame and and and, and so all of a sudden you know Uzziah he starts tasting the glory he tastes the glory the honor the fame the strength the power and instead of falling to his knees and thanking the Lord God for being with him he lets it go into his heart he starts looking at himself starts to sink in pride is so sneaky it starts to do this, and it feels so good. He becomes intoxicated with the feeling. Now, i got to tell you something. You, you can confess it or not confess it. That's between you and the Lord. But the reality is, is your flesh every single day wants glory. It wants honor. Your flesh wants to be worshipped. And how good it feels when people adorn you. When people hold you up and respect you, it feels so good. It's intoxicating. This is one of those sins you're like, man, is this nasty. It comes in. I mean, this is our entire society is built to get you to embrace pride. 
Entire society built for this one thing. The glory of men. We desire it. It's inherent in our flesh. You think of Hollywood and all the stars that are out there. The whole point of that is to look at me. Look at me. I'm in the spotlight. Rock stars and bands. I was in a, I did this. Played the rock uh, guitar and, and did all that stuff. And, and everyone's dream is you're sitting in the garage fantasizing that you're going to be on a stage in front of thousands so they can adore you, so that they can lift their hands and they can raise their hands in honor of what you're doing. is absolutely amazing. I can remember one of the first real rock shows I went to. Now, I grew up in a conservative Christian home and then walked away from the Lord, so I hadn't been exposed to all that. And I remember the first rock show I went to, it was, it was, you know, of course, in my fleshly body, it was so amazing and awesome. But I recognized something unusual. I was like, wow. I'm seeing everybody's hands up. They're just, yeah, this is awesome. And I said, man, this, is, this looks like church, but it's not. Because they were all raising their hands. I recognize you, and I grew up in a, a church where we raised our hands to the Lord to give honor and glory to the Lord. And here I'm in this venue. No, they're not doing that. It's to the people on the stage. It's to men. Give honor and glory to the man. And we got to come to grips. Every single one of us want that glory. Your flesh desires it. And I, I challenge you to start searching your motives of why you do specific things in life. Because you're going to find out oftentimes the motive is not pure. It is to beget the respect of those around you. I need to be respected. I mean, we live in a generation of YouTube and, and Facebook where we get this idea. We got to post it on Facebook because you know what? Everybody wants to know what I think because I matter. I, that in fact, every, when I just get a thought, I need to post it on Facebook. That's how important I am. That's how people crave who I am and what I have to say. This is, you know, it, it sounds funny, but I'm telling you, this is the generation we live in. It's deadly. This is, it's intoxicating. And here we see a man of God, anointed of God, God with him, falling victim to this very sin. But here's the problem. When you embrace pride, there are strings attached. There are strings attached. There's the natural order of events that is going to follow. And we see that right here. Here we read right at the beginning of verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. What's the next thing we read? And to the four, he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering into the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. The very next thing we read is he transgressed. Embrace pride and you will sin. It's inevitable. It's the natural law of pride. You will not avoid it. Pride comes before destruction. When I see a man pursuing pride, embracing pride, I don't need to be a prophet. I know his end. It is destruction. And he can go around and profess Yeshua and he can profess Jesus and he can look like a sold out Christian all he wants and I know where you're going to be. I know where you're going. Not because I'm a prophet, because the Bible tells me so. God's word is true. It will not fail. Remember that. When you're confronted with pride, his word will not fail. You embrace it, you're going down. Destruction is in your future. And so here we see Uzziah who is intoxicated with vain glory. And here's another aspect of pride. Learn this. He now is entering into the temple, which is forbidden. He is transgressing. He's walking over the commandment of God. It's called rebellion. He is entering in rebellion. Rebellion is a manifestation of pride. This is what freaks me out so much about looking at today's progressive modern day Christianity. Not recognizing rebellion against God's holiness, against his commandments, it's pride. It's pride. I told you, it will wear a thousand different masks. It will come at you in different ways. And so Uzziah, who he goes into the temple, it's only for the Kohanim to go into, to offer incense in the holy place. And we pick it up here. So Azariah the Kohen went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. 
And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziahu, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Oh, and look at this. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. One thing I can promise you, embrace pride, you will lose the honor of the Lord. Now that is devastating. If you fear God, if you love Yeshua, the number one thing on your docket is to gain his honor. To gain his honor. Embrace pride, it will be stripped from you. It'll be totally taken from you. That's scary. You know, I think of John chapter 12, it says in John 12, there were many among the rulers in Yeshua's day who actually believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They rather have the honor of men than the honor of God. What did Uzziahu do? He wanted the honor that was bestowed upon the Kohanim, and he took it. But he didn't want the honor of God because he would have feared God. See, when you're seeking to honor God, when you're seeking his honor to be bestowed upon you, you're seeking to please him. You're seeking to be a worshiper of him. You will be very different. You will be a peculiar people when you embrace that kind of obedience and humility. Continuing on. So here we see, okay, so the priests rebuke Uzziahu. How does Uzziahu respond? It says he became furious. Now this is, the, what did we just read last week in, in Psalm 141? Oh, oh, that the, that the righteous would, would rebuke me and it would be kindness. This is what he said. This is what we read in the Psalms. This is a righteous man yearns to be admonished, to be set straight. But here, Uzziahu, what do we find? Pride set in. It is set in. He is not letting go. And now he's angry with these priests. The exact opposite response. He's in total rebellion. And the source is pride. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the Kohanim, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the Kohanim in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. Verse 21. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Yotam, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Look at the effects of pride. Total destruction. Uzziahu wanted the honor. He wanted the glory of man. And what he got was the rejection of the Lord. He was humbled. He exalted himself... But the Lord brought him low to the point when you think of Uzziahu and all this time. And how many people do you think came up to him and said, Uzziahu, look at what the Lord has done to your kingdom. It's amazing. You've become so strong. Who could come up against you? The Lord stands with you. Nobody. And he's taking it in and it becomes intoxicating, intoxicating. Now he's a leper. No one will go see him because he's a leper. And he's cut off from the very house he desired to go to. Total devastation, he's lost everything for the sake of pride. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. Think about this. The next time you're going to embrace pride, see, there are a few passages that are for me that are a go-to. This is one of them. Every time you go to embrace pride, know this. You're an abomination to the Lord, no matter, how, no matter how you try to spin it. And all the sacrifice that you've done for Yeshua and his kingdom, do not be deceived. Unfortunately, that's what pride does. It deceives. I want to share a story with you that for me, it's probably the most pivotal story that has brought a realization and tear into me in regard to pride. And it's a story found in Ezekiel 28. And it's a prophecy of Hasatan. It's all about his fall. And so I want to read this to you. And we're going to learn a lot about pride in this, in this uh, story. 
Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now I want to be very clear. Yes, this was a lamentation for the king of Tyre, but it's a prophetic revelation of Hasatan. And you'll see this because it talks about him being in the Garden of Eden. We're not going to get into that. But there is no question here. It's this is the adversary. This is the one that's in view. And what we read is he was the seal of perfection. Now I ask you, how many of you have been called the seal of perfection? Not me. Never been called the seal of perfection. This one was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Perfect in beauty. Well, and we understand why this is as we continue to the next verse. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I want to stop right there. So when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, you'll notice there are two cherubim covering the throne, the mercy seat of God. And these angels spread out their wings over that. You think Lucifer, Hasatan, he was a covering cherub. He was the closest angel and out of all the angels in heaven to God, he was absorbing his radiant glory. Think about being that close. You couldn't help but be the seal of perfection and perfect in beauty. Absolutely, all that beautiful radiance of who God really is emanating. And literally, Hasatan, as he's hanging over the throne of God, is taking that in. That's the kind of beauty that even the other angels of heaven, they looked upon in awe. And we'll see this in, in, in a second. So he says, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. What was the problem? What happened? We go to verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Now, I want to stop right there. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. So instead of now focusing and looking at God, which is interesting, because what you'll realize in these covering cherubim, as they're over the ark of God, both of them are looking at the throne. Their eyes are on God. See, but now Hasatan is taking his eyes off him. He starts looking at what God has made him. He's looking and he's like, I am beautiful. I'm incredible. There's no question the other angels recognize that. He took his eyes off of God and started looking at himself at his own accomplishments. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I want you to think about that. Here you have Hasatan who's seen God for what he is, who literally hung over the throne of God, given all this perfect wisdom. All of it was for naught. It was all corrupted the moment he grabbed onto pride. It evaporated. Now you think about all that the Lord has done in your life, all this miraculous things. I mean, one of the things that I cherish more than anything is as I go through the word, my relationship with the Lord and how he builds into it and how he reveals himself to me through this word. And it's all, wow, it's all wisdom. It's all truth. It's all righteousness. And it will go up in smoke the moment I grab onto pride. It'll avail me nothing. I will lose everything. What is the point in that? You think about this. The next time you're confronted with pride, when you know you have selfish motivations, when you want glory, when you want to be exalted, when you want to be respected. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And now it's not done. We learned something else about pride. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. So what does God do with Satan when he embraces pride? He casts him out of his presence. Is that something that any of us want? You know, Isaiah 42, he will not give his glory to another. Man, put that verse on your fridge and live by it. We should be living by that principle. He will not give his glory to another. So then when in all our actions, we meditate on that very thing. Amen. Do not, do not underestimate the destructive power of pride. 
Something else in regard to pride that I want to point out. Remember, it was because of pride that the devil attempted to take the throne of God. And I want you to think about that for a second. Think about that context. It was pride that drove him to take the throne of God. Now I ask you, did he ever have a chance? And you laugh, you scoff, you say, that's ridiculous. What was he thinking? So foolish, like he can actually destroy uh, the Lord God who made him? You need to learn something from this, because this is very important. With pride comes delusion. And I want you to understand something. Not for a moment did the devil believe he couldn't do it. He believed he could do it. I'll take it a step farther. He so believed that he could do it. He was so beautiful in his ways and so full of wisdom and so revered. He convinced a third of heaven that he could and that they could, that they could take the throne of God. How do you convince a third of heaven, angels who serve and minister and see God for who he is? You think about this. Not for a moment did he believe he couldn't do it. When you embrace pride, you will be delusional. You will not see things for what they really are. The devil will completely distort the picture for you. And you think you're going through reality and you think you're going to accomplish things and you think you're going to reach the goal that you want with this total worship of you, essentially. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. God is not going to give his glory to another. There is one last thing I do want to point out in regard to what Satan did and the effects, the fruit of pride. So when Satan gathers a third of heaven, he goes to make war against the angels of God who stayed faithful to him to take the throne. In effect, what, wait, wait a second, what just happened? Think about this. The kingdom of God was divided. That's a manifestation of what? Pride. The kingdom of God became divided. I mean, that's hard to wrap your mind around. Do you think it's going to be any different than here on earth? Look at what this says in Proverbs 28, 25. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, stirs up division. Again, show me men that have gone out to cause division in communities, and I'll show you the problem. It's pride. They've gone out to do, they're doing exactly what Hasatan had done in heaven. I want to give you one more example it's the story of Hezekiah. I saved this one uh, for last in regard to this topic anyways. And the backdrop is the king of Assyria has come up against Hezekiah in his threatening to destroy him. You know, you need to totally submit, give, you know, make peace with us. You're, you're leaving. We're going to take you captive, but uh, we'll let you live and it'll be fine. No one has ever survived and no city has survived Assyria. And think about this. It was Assyria that took Israel out. They took the northern kingdom out. So Assyria comes in with great pomp. So Hezekiah is freaking out. This is a real situation. And so what's he do? Well, we read in 2 Chronicles 32, 20. Now because of this, King Hezekiah and the prophet Yeshayahu, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. Hezekiah was righteous. And he did what was righteous. He acted wisely. We see this. Going on to verse 21, then the Lord sent an angel and cut down every mighty man of valor and leader and captain and encamped in the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. Verse 22, thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. And guided them on every side. I want you to understand what the Lord did when he came against it. 185,000 Assyrians fell at the hand of the Lord. You want to talk about a mass slaughter. This is something that went to the ends of the earth. This battle that the Lord waged on behalf of, of Hezekiah. Because he turned and prayed. I mean, think about that victory, that kind of battle in this day. Incredible. It's a beautiful story of deliverance. Well, look at what we read as we continue on. 
And many brought gifts to the Lord at Yerushalayim and presents to Hezekiah, king of Yehuda. Look at this. So that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. Because this awesome victory of the living God, Hezekiah received this glory and honor. I get that. I understand why these people are, are looking at him like this. This is amazing. This man is favored by God. This man has the power of God. This is, it's incredible. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord. And he spoke to him and gave him a sign. And that was the sign of the shadow going back 10 degrees. But again, Hezekiah, the Lord says, put your house in order. You're going to die. Hezekiah does it again. He goes back to the Lord and prays, and the Lord delivers him again. I mean, this is his history. Testimony after testimony, deliverance after deliverance. We move on to verse 25. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. Look at this. For his heart was lifted up. I want you to think about this. Think about everything the Lord had done for him. And even the stuff that's not recorded. And it says, Hezekiah did not repay to the favor shown him. His heart was lifted up. This is interesting because we just learned something about pride. Those who have an ungrateful and unthankful spirit, you have an issue of pride somewhere. Now that, will make, I told you, this thing wears thousands of different masks. Things that you would think you'd come out. No, they're not pride. Yes, they are pride. I'll give you an example of myself. I'll turn the spotlight to myself for a moment. When we first started, the ministry started going out. Listen, I needed to do everything. I had to have my hands in everything. I got to control everything. Firstborn type A all day long. This is what I need. Because when I'm not in control, well, the whole house is out of control. This is what I saw. And so, and, but, you know, you tell yourself, well, I'm being a responsible person. See, it's, it's amazing how you look at this. And I'm going to tell you, it was pride. And fortunately, the Lord dealt with that. I started delegating. And what you find out, oh, the Lord is the boss. He's in control. This is his community. It's his kingdom. I'll step back. And what he did is he brought in people that are better than myself, more talented, more gifted, more capable. And you look at it and you say, you're right, Lord. You're better. Your way is better. But it's amazing how little things like that, you don't identify them as pride. You justify them. You turn them. You twist them. And you come to wrong conclusions. And then you're on this hamster wheel of insanity. And you wonder why your life doesn't change. It's crazy. And so here we read, where am I at? Verse 25. His heart was lifted up. Now listen, there's something else here. Because his heart was lifted up, there's an effect. There's fruit. Therefore wrath was looming over him. Over Yehuda and Yerushalayim. Wrath. Was it, remember that little proverb out of 16? Pride comes before destruction. You don't need to be a prophet to know. Once Hezekiah grabbed that in his heart, he, he harnessed that pride. That's when wrath was coming. It's like it's just, it, it, it's the natural law. The Lord cannot deny himself. Wrath is going out. Wrath will come forth. But here's the good news. This is why I saved this story for last. Because in verse 26, we read this. Then Hezekiah, what did he do? He humbled himself for the pride of his heart. He and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Do you see the power of humility? The power of humility, it has the power to save. Do you want salvation? Embrace humility. We read this in Psalm 149.4. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. The Lord's word is true. The only people that will be beautified are those who are prostrate. Those who are not seeking respect and recognition and to be acknowledged and to be glorified and to be lifted up. They're not even on the radar. The people that the Lord is coming for, that he's going to give salvation, that he's going to hear, are those who humble themselves. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen? The Lord is near. Do you want relationship with the Lord? Does the Lord feel distant from you? The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. 
If you feel distance from the Lord, go looking for pride. Because he will not dwell with it. He will only, come, he will only draw near to those who humble themselves. We have to be people that are clothed in humility. I want to take you to Proverbs 25. Something interesting is said in this proverb, and it has to do with Hezekiah. So I just want to show you this. There are also, these are also Proverbs of Solomon. Now listen to this. Which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Okay, so this particular, this particular chapter of Proverbs 25, the men that dwelt with Hezekiah, that saw everything we just read, and everything Hezekiah went through, they were witnesses, they were there. They copied specific Proverbs from Solomon. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Look at what they wrote down. Look at what they copied. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. And I want to stop right there. Do not exalt yourself. In, there is deep spiritual connotation. As believers in Yeshua, there's only one that should come to mind above all else, and that is King Yeshua and him alone. And the text is very clear. Do not exalt yourself in his presence. Well, I want you to think about Psalm 139 for a second. And what does David say? He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I go into heaven. You are there. I make my bed in hell. You are there. In other words, the, the point he was making is, is there's nowhere I can go from the presence of the king. If that's the case, do not exalt yourself anywhere. No matter where you are in this world, no matter what situation it is, it doesn't allow for us to exalt ourselves. We must humble ourselves in the presence of the king. And it goes on to say this, and do not stand in the place of the great, for it is better that you say, uh, that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like a passage you might have heard before? Luke, Luke 14. And I passed by that. Sorry about that. But Luke 14, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, okay, and, this, and I, I highlighted that because this is, the, this is talking about the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's deep spiritual connotation here. When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you uh, and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. Going on to verse 10. But when you are invited, go and sit down to the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Is exactly what was just said in Proverbs 25. And it all relates to humbling yourself in the sight of the one who invited you. The invitation to come into the kingdom of God, that means Yeshua. And so when we read Paul's statement, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. A powerful statement when you have this backdrop of what Paul had and knowing all these things about pride and the destruction that it rots against the communities and against us individually. Now, continuing on in Galatians 6, 4. And we're doing okay. I think I'll blow through this last half here. Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And then it goes on and says, for each one shall bear his own load. Now you need to understand, Paul's ripping this right out of the Torah. He's taking this right out of the prophets. Whether we're talking uh, Ezekiel, uh, we could talk about the book of Deuteronomy, but I'll just give you one example, Jeremiah. In those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every, uh, everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Verses, in, in other words, in Deuteronomy 24, the Lord says, a man shall not be put to death for the sins of his children. And vice versa, the children are not to be put to death for the sins of the fathers. Okay? And this is what Paul is bringing out. So he's bringing out a very important point that you're going to bear your own load. You better wake up. You're going to have to account for it. Nobody else is going to account for you. Moving on to verse 6. Let him who is taught the word, and, and here's what, what it says here, share in all good things with him who teaches. 
Now, when you look at how Paul utilizes this word share in the Greek, it's koinoneo, okay? And he's specifically using it in the context uh, the same way that he uses this term in Romans or he uses it in Philippians. And it's explicitly in the context of not hearing a sermon and go, man, afterward, I got I to gotta run up to Daniel and just say, you know what? The Holy Spirit really spoke to you. It really ministered to me today. That's exactly what I was dealing with. And I just appreciate that. That is not what this is dealing with. That is not what it's dealing with at all. It's dealing with support, contributions, supporting the shepherds, supporting the pastors and the teachers. And you need to appreciate why Paul is bringing this to the table. I want to be very clear on something. The Apostle Paul is not concerned about lining the pockets of pastors and preachers and teachers so that they can fly around in $45 million planes. This is not what he is concerned about. He is making the statement because he knows how vitally important it is to the community that this principle, the principle is carried out. And to help you appreciate this, we're just going to spend a couple minutes on this. But I want to take you to 1 Corinthians. It's a passage we looked at in regard to the spirit of the Torah. But we're going to go back and, and reread this. And we're not going to read it all. I'm going to jump around here. But 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard, and does not eat of its fruit, who tends a flock, and does not drink of the milk of the flock. All these are rhetorical questions. Of course a man doesn't go to war at his own expense. He doesn't plant a vineyard, doesn't drink of, or eat of the fruit. He doesn't tend to flock, doesn't drink of the milk. Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law, the Torah, say the same also? For it is written in the Torah of Moshe, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of of his hope. Uh, Verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Mashiach. Do you not know that those who minister of the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. In other words, Paul's going back, drawing back to the Torah, and he's saying, look at the Kohanim. They're serving in the house of the Lord, okay? And people are all over Israel are bringing their sacrifices, and even Gentiles, but they're bringing their sacrifices up to the temple, and it's the priests that are consuming these things that they're bringing to the Lord. The priests are partaking in that. And then he comes to the punchline. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. I want you to understand this is exactly what Paul is communicating to the Galatians. See, he is setting things in order for protection, for their spiritual growth in Galatia. And this is one of the things he brings to the table. And it's not the only time he says this elsewhere, too, in 1 1 Timothy 5.17. Let the elders who rule well... Be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. And that doctrine is teaching. So those who are literally dedicating their lives to studying the word, to being in relationship, to praying to the Lord. And then what they do is they feed the flock. They act as real shepherds and they go and feed the flock. He says, especially those who labor in word or doctrine. Then he goes on and says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the labor is worthy of his wages. And so we see, you look at Paul's various epistles and we just looked at three different epistles. I did this because you need to understand this is something that was of deep concern to Paul that he needed to establish, that he desired to establish and where all the churches are being set up. This had to happen, and there was a reason, and you have to understand the reason, and we're going to talk about that. Now, the first thing I want to do is I just want to show you that Paul the Apostle, this isn't a new thing. This was a thing that Hezekiah, since we've been talking about Hezekiah, this was the very thing that Hezekiah did. He acted in righteousness. This was his concern for his people. 
We read this in 2 Chronicles 31, 4. Moreover, he, Hezekiah, commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the Kohanim and the Levites. They were the teachers of Torah, that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. See, this is the thing. Hezekiah recognized we need to have these men immersed and clothed in the word of God. They must devote themselves to the law of the Lord. We're told in Malachi chapter 2, the people were to seek the Torah from their mouth. They were to go as sheep at going to a shepherd. They were seek life, truth, righteousness, conviction, strength, honor, encouragement. All of these things the sheep were to run to. They, they were to go. But you have to have shepherds delivering to the sheep what they need. Caring for them, protecting them. But I'm going to tell you this, when this design isn't followed, when communities and people begin to, as they say, muzzle the ox, bad things start to happen to the community. And the apostle Paul knows this. This is his concern. It's not about lining the pockets of preachers and teachers. He knows what will happen to communities. All you need to do is read 2 Chronicles 15. Go and read that and you could see how Israel had been separated from God. And the one thing that is mentioned there, the one characteristic that is brought forth is they didn't have Torah teachers going through the land teaching the Torah. No shepherds. You strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. But it's interesting, go two chapters to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 17. And Jehoshaphat stirred revival in Israel. And how did he do it? He sent out the priests and the Levites armed to the teeth with the Torah. He sent them out and they stirred up revival. They brought true revival. The fear of God came over the people and they turned back to God. It was awesome. This is what the Apostle Paul knows. This is what he knows. Unfortunately, this is also what the devil knows. And if you think that he's not coming to interrupt, if you think he's not going to come to muzzle the oxen, you're deceived. He is coming to muzzle the oxen. I want to give you a biblical example in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is he, he's with King Artaxerxes in Shushan, the citadel. He's not in Jerusalem. And he's serving the king. And his heart is broken before the Lord because news comes to him that his people are in deep distress. They're mourning. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. It's in total disarray. Nehemiah drops to his knees. He prays one of the awesomest prayers you're going to read in Scripture for repentance and remission. And this is what he does. The next thing we read, the Lord gives him favor to go back and to put the house in order, to get God's house in order. And it's amazing. He comes in and what do you read? Well, you read they're not keeping the Shabbat. Nehemiah comes against them. What are you doing? We've been destroyed because we have not observed the Shabbat. He recognizes that they've married pagan women who are leading them astray into their false gods. He rebukes them for that. Well, look at what else he rebukes them for. The very thing the apostle Paul knew. I also realized that the portions for the Levites, teachers of Torah, had not been given to them. For each of the Levites and singers who did the work, they had gone back to their field. They abandoned their post. The shepherds left. They went home. Because the enemy came in and corrupted. He entered. He muzzled the oxen. And you can see the effect. They're in total disarray because no shepherds are gone forth. So I contended with the rulers and I said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. This is Paul's concern. He does not want the house of God forsaken. This has to happen. Now, I bring this up obviously because Paul makes the point in Galatians 6.6. 6, but I also want to warn you of a new trend that is happening. It is a trend that is blowing my mind. I first saw this several years ago, and, and I, I got to be honest with you, I was baffled beyond compare. Listening to a scholar, a Christian scholar, talk about how tithing was, it was not biblical. How tithing was an Old Testament thing, and we don't, need, we don't need to do that. We're under the New Testament now. And now that really 
kind of took me back because I was like, oh my goodness, you're grabbing the one thing that Christians have actually kept out of the Old Testament in New Testament times. How is this possible? I mean, the earth shook, spiritually speaking. When I heard this, I was like, no, that can't be right. And I was like, and this was several, this is five, maybe six years ago uh, that I heard this and I'm like, oh man, nothing will come out of this. Uh, hold on. If you notice what's going on in the last couple of years, in fact, just recently, I had a few articles sent to me, and we're just going to close with these articles to show you how crazy it really is getting. And you understand Paul's concern. It'll mean a lot more. Um, this came out of the Daily Post. Payment of tithe, not mandatory. No curses attached. And this is what it says. According to the cleric, he's talking about the pastor who preached this message. Curses attached to failure to pay tithe have expired and only work in the Old Testament. The pastor said this while addressing his congregation yesterday, where he also pointed out that the tithe was paid in the Old Testament as a law with curses attached to it, failure to pay. And so one thing they recognize is that the Tanakh, it, there's no question about it. Tithing is commanded. That's not a debate. We'll see. But see, when you throw up the Torah, I told you this, the sky is the limit. Anything is possible when you throw out the Torah. The enemy is coming to remove the shepherds. And there are still many, many good shepherds in Christianity today that are up there with integrity of their heart and they're preaching their heart out and they're willing to die for the gospel. The things, things are turning, people. He goes on. He said Christians should not be pressured or forced to pay tithe. Adding that not paying tithes does not attract a curse for a Christian anymore. He said, since we are under a new covenant, giving is a choice. So now commandments of God are suggestions. We got that. Everyone should decide the percentage they want to pay with the knowledge that you will be blessed based on how you give. Isn't that nice? That's fantastic. We just you decide whatever you want to do. If it feels right, it feels good. If the, you know what? If the Spirit moves you, by all means, keep the commandment of God. But wait a second. You're not, you're, you don't have to keep the commandment of God. That doesn't matter. One more, and this came out of um, the, the Christian Post. This is a scholar. In an op-ed for the Gospel Coalition in 2017, Thomas Schreiner, the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation and Associate Dean for Scripture and Interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I need a degree to read that. He outlined several reasons why tithing is not a requirement for Christians, and this was the main one. The commands stipulated in the Mosaic Covenant are no longer in force for believers. See, he's coming after the oxen. The enemy is coming to, to, to muzzle the oxen. I'm telling you that we're in this day and age. And one thing I can do, this is not, to boast, this is not about boasting. This is to tell you so that you understand this ministry, we support other shepherds because we believe in what Paul says here in Galatians 6, 6. We need pray that the Lord send out labors into the harvest. We need people laboring and dedicated to the word of God, clothing themselves in the word and in prayer because out, without these shepherds, and I'm not talking about corner friends, I'm talking about around the world, we are in desperate need of these people. And if you get in conversations with your Christian friends and family, you tell them, to support the good shepherds, the ones not flying around in $45 million planes, the ones that are sacrificial, the ones that serve their community, the ones you know that when they take the pulpit, they preach the word of God without reservation. They're not intimidated. They're going to stand against the evil and they're going to speak the truth. This is what we do. Amen? Okay. That's a good point to end on. All right.